Let's thank you. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for the invitation, PJ. And it's um, really, really a pleasure and an honor to be with you all here tonight talking about the case for local grain. Um, and I'm really excited to hear more from um, Jessica in a little bit, who actually has her hands on the grain <laughs> in the bakery. Um, but I'm here tonight. Um, my name is Liz Carlisle, and I'm a professor at UC Santa Barbara and the author of a couple books about rebuilding regional grain economies. I'm originally from Montana. And just to kind of give you a sense of how I got into this issue and, and why it's become something that is, is really important to me. Um, my grandmother lost our family farm in the Dust Bowl. So the, the problems with um, you know, the commodity grain economy are something that my family is, is really intimately familiar with. And, Growing up in Montana, I saw that a lot of other agricultural families that still had their land um, were really struggling in the commodity grain economy. It just frankly wasn't a game that farmers could win. And, um, you know, through the 80s, I, I, as a really young person, I saw a lot of folks in Montana and other grain farming regions lose their farms and go bankrupt um, or just really struggle to hang on. Um, and that was a period of time when a lot of farmers who didn't want to lose their land came together and said, you know, what could we do to get out of this commodity trap where we're constantly paying really high prices for fertilizers and herbicides and then getting paid next to nothing for our grain and, and not being able really to control any of those markets and not being paid for quality, you know, just really. Oh my God, being... seven pounds. <laughs> Hello. Liz, you're on mute now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, really just seeing that the commodity grain economy wasn't working for farmers. And, you know, clearly it wasn't working for the environment either. Um, you know, these heavy applications of fertilizers and herbicides were taking a toll on the environment. Um, fertilizer is manufactured with fossil fuel. It also, um, because plants can't take all of it up in these industrial systems, it also gets emitted as nitrous oxide. Um, and of course, you know, the, the toll on wildlife and on community water systems from these chemicals, I'm sure many of you are really familiar with. So I was really inspired um, as a young person when uh, John Tester, who was an organic farmer in Eastern Montana, ran for the US Senate. Um, and was actually elected to the United States Senate um, from Montana, really on this platform of a green economy based on his experience, um, you know, with a regional grain economy and farming organically and selling into local and regional markets where he could get paid for quality, he could get paid for environmental stewardship, and he could get paid for providing, you know, a healthier product um, to his own community. And I ended up um, going to work in the tester office um, when I was 24 as a legislative correspondent for agriculture and natural resources. And through that job, meeting a bunch of other organic farmers who had converted from commodity grain to growing organically for regional markets and um, who had really compelling stories about um, you know, what it had done for their soil, what it had done for their family's ability to economically stay on their land. And then also just, just the difference of actually selling to people, you know, actually selling a, a, a food product to people and, and knowing the people who were gonna eat that product rather than just this anonymous grain that goes off into who knows where. And so that's, that's kind of how I got connected to this community in Montana. That, that's much like um, the community in Colorado around the grain chain and ended up um, going to graduate school and working on research projects to understand that story and ultimately um, writing the book Lentil Underground and then also co-writing a book um, with Bob Quinn called Grain by Grain. So um, I'm just really passionate about this movement to, to re-regionalize grain um, for all the environmental, economic, and health benefits. And there's clearly really important roles to be played all along that supply chain from the folks who steward the seeds, um, you know, and are breeding grains for organic systems to the folks who grow the grain, <laughs> um, you know, to, to local scale processing, you know, rebuilding those regional mills, um, you know, to folks like Jessica, who are, you know, uh, 
providing communities with their own local bakery and, and that connection for eaters into this whole um, grain chain. So um, with no further ado, I think now's a great time to actually hear directly from Jessica about um, her experience uh, at Tumbleweed Bread. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, so I run a cottage foods bakery in Southern Colorado. Um, cottage foods in Colorado is, is a pretty amazing program um, where you can bake out of your home. Um, out of an unlicensed kitchen, as long as you follow a certain, you know, set of rules. Um, but it's been really great for me personally, because I, I moved back to Colorado from Portland, Oregon, um, to take over the care for my mom who has Parkinson's disease. Um, so I immediately fell into being a full time caregiver and couldn't really um, look for a job outside of the home. Um, and in a lot of ways, that was a blessing because it kind of forced me to create something out of my house. And um, I know that Chris Gosar of Mountain Mama Milling had been operating uh, in the area for a long time. And I had no idea that he was just right outside town. And just it's such an amazing connection to have here where I just drive maybe 10 minutes to go grab my flour straight from the mill. And so it just seemed like, I don't know, just like a serendipitous sort of thing for me to start something here and just ever so slowly um, realizing just all the amazing resources that we have down here, like Jones Organic Farms, um, growing a lot of new grain, that's really exciting. Um, and there's lots of other people just growing, you know, a handful of emmer here and there, um, a handful of rye. Uh, and I just really hope to see that grow. Um, unfortunately, as a cottage foods bakery, I am quite small at this point. So I really only bake between 50 and 80 loaves a week currently, mostly through a bread subscription program. Um, so people sign up for a month long a uh, subscription of bread. And then we, uh, as soon as COVID started, we started delivering all across the valley. Um, we have a beat up little car that gets good gas mileage with a lot of bumper stickers on it. And uh, <laughs> we leave bread on the doorstep and we run away basically. Um, so hopefully that's been really good for our community during this time, especially kind of the older population that, you know, in general, in the winter, it's kind of difficult to get out. And especially when COVID was really scary in the beginning, um, just nobody knew a lot. And so being able to provide that service, I think has been huge for our community. And actually, I think we've gotten a lot more sales in the past year because just of that in, in particular, even though we weren't able to be at the farmer's market last year. Um, yeah, but so, I, like I mentioned, I came from Portland, Oregon, where I worked there for about 10 years. Um, and before I moved, I, I was head baker at Tabor Bread. Um, and they do such an amazing job. They mill everything in house. They have a huge wood fired oven. Everything is naturally leavened, you know, and that just really opened my eyes to this, you know, really old school way of making bread and they're also such a community bakery, even in such a large city. And that was just so inspiring. So I knew that whenever I started something myself, you know, I would have to do that. Like I wasn't gonna go back to just making, you know, white sourdough bread. Like uh, it just hurts to even think about kind of trying to do that. So, um, you know, I am very passionate about whole grain and trying to use as much, as many different grains as possible in my bread. For my customers. I feel like this is a good moment to actually look at some of these beautiful breads and oh. Je <laughs> Jessica sent me some pictures earlier today um, that I stuck in a PowerPoint so I'm going to share my screen now and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, what we're looking at. So here, sure. just bear with me here as I go yeah. into full, full screen. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I, like I mentioned, I bake out of my house. I have a, a Rothko oven from Belgium. Um, it's a, a small, pretty small company and they are just inundated with orders from 
micro bakers all over the country who have really um, grown this past year because of COVID actually. So I was lucky, I've, I've had my oven for a few years now, but I did some hot cross buns this year for Easter. So that's some of them cooling. Mm -hmm. um, that's the 100% whole grain mountain mama loaf. It's just our, our local organic mountain mama flour, a little bit of um, local raw honey and starter and, and water and salt. That's my favorite loaf. And I always sell it for $5 because I, I really want that loaf in particular to be very accessible. Mm. Cool. That's the inside of the oven. Um, that's some um, uh, dark chocolate and chile caribe uh, sourdough loaves. Oh, and these I need to, I, I promised to send Liz a whole bunch of cookies in the mail, but um, these are 100% <laughs> uh, organic soft, soft whole wheat um, dark chocolate cookies that are also sourdough. They ferment in the in the fridge actually for about 48 hours before I scoop them. Um, so they're just like exceptionally delicious. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's, um, that's the cornmeal and Adama loaf, which I have been making with blue cornmeal from bow and arrow. Um, and today I just made some with yellow cornmeal, just trying out uh, a different spin on it. And that's um, turmeric onion loaves resting. Um, I adapted this formula from Sarah Owen's book, Sourdough, which in a, is an amazing um, book if anybody is out out there who's a baker and kind of just getting into sourdough. She has a really um, amazing and approachable uh, bread book out there. And those are also the whole wheat mountain mama loaves. Um, there's just something about a nice whole grain pan loaf. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, um, since you were just kind of getting into that now, about where you source your flour, um, you know, a little right. bit of the, the story um, behind these grains. Yeah. Um, so like I mentioned, I, I live very close to the Mountain Mama Milling Mill. Um, and so uh, Chris Goser, he, he normally moves mostly um, hard red wheat and soft white wheat, but he also, um, you know, occasionally sources rye, um, rouge de Bordeaux. Um, uh, he also gets spelt from Rocky Draw Farms um, in Mancos, I believe. Um, so yeah, just I'm crazy lucky to just be able to drive right out there. Often, you know, I drive up and he is literally milling the flour into the bag and stitches it up and hands it over to me, you know. Um, and as always, it's, it's great to catch up with him because uh, he's, he's an amazing person. I'm sure a few of you know Chris. Um, he's been such a big part of the uh, food economy in the Valley for, for such a long time. And I do also supplement some of my whole grains. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a completely whole grain bakery though. I, every time I bake, I put like 1% more whole grain in just to see how much I can kind of get away with without anybody sort of like, you know, saying this is like health food. Um, but uh, I do right now actually kind of have a favor with a baker in um, Colorado Springs, David at Nightingale Bread. He does let me buy some central milling um, organic um, artisan baker's craft flour from him also. So that's, that's the white flour that I do use in some of my loaves, like the turmeric onion loaf, for example, has that. So and then this regional mill, that's like this. Yes. Link yes. Chain, and this, like your access point to all of these local and regional farmers growing these diverse grains. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And like I said, me, like I'm such a small operation, you know, I don't have 
the ability to just request, you know, large amounts of grain or flour from distributors, you know, so having Chris be that go between for me has been amazing. And um, actually now I sell some of his flour for him also so that, uh, you know, he's not always um, bugged by people necessarily who just want like 10 pounds of flour, for example, because he's running all over the state delivering, you know, everywhere. And so if I can kind of help him out and be the go between for those smaller orders of flour, you know, that's been really great. Um, and I love, I love being able to, to do that for him. Um, also, I do get Emmer from actually some farmers that are down near La Jara. Um, and I get that from them independently, not through Chris, but they grow organic emmer at Cactus Hill Farm. And they've been customers of mine for a long time. So we actually just trade bread subscriptions for emmer. And that's that's been very cool. Awesome. I mean, and I don't know how many folks on the call have, have tried emmer, <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe we should just go into that a little bit too about, you know, sort of like, what are these grains? How... Um, you know, how are they distinct from, you know, all purpose flour <laughs> that oh, maybe yeah. most of us might be um, more familiar with? And, you know, what have you found as a baker, um, you know, what draws you to some of these other, I guess some of them are probably more heritage wheats or ancient wheats, but other things are distinct from modern wheat entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I kind of got to know a lot of these ancient and heritage um, grains while working at Taper Bread. Um, yeah, I would not have known that there was such a world out there. And also I attended the grain gathering in, in Washington at the WSU Bread Lab a few years. Um, and that is just an amazing, amazing operation up there. Um, so it's, it's been very cool to, to learn about um, all these different kinds of wheats and how, you know, not necessarily all modern wheats are, are terrible because you can see the work that they're doing there at the bread lab. And, you know, for example, um, they are growing a, something called, they, call, they named it Skagit 1109, which doesn't have like a very romantic name but um it's it's a beautiful beautiful wheat and from what i remember when i saw it in the field is that they adapted it so that um some of the uh heads would mature kind of you know up at the top of the crop but there would also be ones that were kind of lower so they had a lot of quite a bit of yield for a small amount of space because the the heads were basically you know offset and that's, you know, something that they figured out how to do, um, you know, over time. So, you know, it's, it's not just that only ancient and heritage wheats are worthwhile, you know, um, but certainly there's, I work with a lot of different grains because of the flavor, for one, I just, mm. um, you know, you get a lot of these like gram nice graham crackery flavors from these these whole grains and they're just really fun to work with and kind of figure out how to use because some of them just really aren't good for bread and that's yeah. fine but they're still worthwhile you know to work into the rotation like the emmer is quite tough to work with in bread but um you know I've worked it up to about 50 percent using emmer but it's amazing also as biscotti mm -hmm. um so, you know, just this kind of race to make all these different wheats to be um, perfect for big lofty loaves of bread, you know, I, I think we're losing sight a little bit of all the different ways that you can use these heritage grains, but I'm not really the expert. I would say that Liz, you're, you're really the expert on the, the scene. I 
I love I love hearing the perspective from the bakery, though. Um, but yeah. I see we've got this question from Sarah about you know the distinction between heritage and heirloom and ancient. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm happy to go into that a little bit from my understanding. Um, and I agree with you too about these distinctions. You know that all wheat bread in the last 50 years isn't all of a piece. You know that that most of it has been bread for these more chemically driven monocultural situations. But there are folks like the Bread Lab um, who are breeding for things like flavor and performance in organic systems. So it's not just a case of the older stuff is definitely better than the newer stuff. But um, yeah. as far as, you know, sort of how I understand the terms, um, I understand heirloom and ancient to be referring to seeds that um, are pre-industrial really. So varieties that have been saved within communities sort of before the industrial revolution, before that kind of series of pressures impacted the way agriculture is practiced and the way um, you know seeds are saved and bred for agriculture. And then heritage, I understand, as being sort of like pre-World War II, basically. So a lot of heritage grains, you know, might have been bred um, in universities. They might have been, um, you know, sort of improved varieties intended for increased levels of production. But they came before that big post-World War II kind of agricultural revolution, where all of that technology from World War II that went into munitions was, was transferred into agriculture. And we saw this really heavy application of, of fertilizer and agricultural chemicals, and then grains really bred to perform well under those circumstances. So, you know, the varieties from after World War II, from most of the kind of mainstream um, breeders, whether you're talking about public universities or whether you're talking about the private sector, have really been tailored toward, you know, just as Jessica was saying, to produce really high yields under these conditions where they're managed with chemicals and ideal irrigation and sort of an industrial setup. And then also for industrial bakeries, for this idea that we're going to have really high loaf volume where you could use a pretty low volume of grain, but really puff it up into kind of a wonder bread <laughs> and get a, you know, a lot of volume. Um, you know, that's why they call it loaf volume. So, um, you know, heritage and heirloom and ancient are meaningful to me to, as terms because they're saying, well, let's look at the seed. Um, you know, and the genetic resources, in a sense, that we have from before the time when breeding was really focused on high low volume and, you know, optimal yield under these more industrial conditions. And then I think, you know, folks like the Bread Lab or even, you know, folks connected to the grain chain are then asking, you know, can we utilize um, those great uh, varieties that we have to maybe continue, um, you know, of course, genetics is a dynamic process, even, you know, for seed savers thousands of years ago to continue to evolve, you know, with climate and with the needs of eaters and bakers and farmers. So, yeah, I mean, I'm curious what, what answers you give, Jessica, because you're kind of in this ambassador role in a sense, you know, because you have these customers. And like you said, you know, folks might have been used to, um, you know, like a whole grain sourdough loaf made of emmer <laughs> might be yeah. a thing. So I'm curious what you say to folks about, you know, kind of the why behind all of those things, the whole grains, the more diverse grains, the sourdough. Um, I mean, I guess both, you know, for people's own bodies, but also just kind of in the larger sense for the for the community and for agriculture. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just truly how many people come to me asking for gluten free bread. Um, mm. And that is, to me, the perfect uh, educational opportunity, because a lot of people, you know, just just generally don't really understand um, that a lot of it is is process, you know, a lot of it is, yeah, the type of wheat, the type of bread. Um, so a lot of times, you know, that's when I kind of educate them about, you know, the sourdough process and how that helps to break down a lot of the proteins. So you're essentially getting, you know, a pre-digested pre food um, that can be a lot easier uh, for your body to handle. Um, like my partner, for example, he, uh, he, yeah, doesn't tolerate a lot of, you know, white flour things very well in general. Um, and there, he has like a handful of my loaves that are um, perfect for him in particular. So I, I tend to educate people kind of based on what works for him in a lot of ways. But um, a lot of people actually do after I, I tell them sort of the process and 
you know, the differences in the wheats or the rye, um, you know, they'll, they'll take a chance on a loaf and sometimes it still doesn't work for them. And that's, mm. you know, that's totally fine. Other times they're like, oh my God, I had bread and, you know, it was fine. I didn't think I could have any. Um, so, you know, while I, even though I do have access to, a, you know, a, a number of, of different grains here, I don't have quite, you know, the same access as like, you know, for Boulder or Portland, you know, actually like those really have become quite huge hubs um, where you can get basically anything <laughs> that you want. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of working within what I can source through my local mill or get from, you know, farmer friends around here. Um, but uh, that actually brings me to a question that I have for you, Liz, because mm -hmm. I actually don't know this at all. But um, in thinking about ancient grains like einkorn and emmer and, and spelt, um, you know, here in the valley, the San Luis Valley, uh, we have a lot of water issues and water rights issues, you know, where mm. um, water is always trying to be exported from, from us. So in terms of like the growing of these ancient wheats, do you know if they take less water to grow, um, more water? I, I assume less because they're smaller grains, but you know, I actually don't know. And I, I was wondering if you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is just that, um, you know, most of the folks I've worked with in Montana don't have irrigation. Um, yeah. And a lot of those folks are growing emmer and spelt. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, there, there aren't as many folks doing einkorn just because the milling is more challenging. And so yeah. there hasn't really been as much of a market developed for that because it's just, um, you know, requires different equipment. Um, but there's a, a regional mill um, that's working with emmer and that's working with spelt. Um, a couple yeah. regional mills actually that work with both of those grains. And, um, you know, my sense is in general that, you know, these are, more resilient to weather because they were developed often under dry land conditions, you know, and without the kind of irrigation setups that we've seen over the past century, you know, in some of the more intensive mm -hmm. farming regions. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a good place to look. <laughs> yeah. We're thinking about, you know, what are, what are the grains and what are the foods in general that are going to be more adaptive um, as we're dealing with, with climate. Yeah. Well, because, I mean, that's something that I am really passionate about here in the Valley in general, too. Like, you know, a lot of my friends are farmers, you know, I, my, my family, you know, we're not farmers, but um, my best friend, you know, I grew up like helping with their, their lambs and their alfalfa and like going on the four wheeler to check the sprinklers, you know, and so, and she currently, well, she worked for Farm Bureau of Colorado for a while. So like, you know, I just know how, how important, um, yeah, like stewardship of the land is here in the valley and especially our water rights. Mm. Um, yeah, it can get very complicated. <laughs> so, you know, knowing about kind of different things that can be grown that are profitable for the farmer and everybody in the grain chain, you know, is, is a great thing to know. Yeah. And, you know, in Colorado, you know, distinct from maybe Montana, you also have the comparison point of like grains versus maybe specialty vegetable crops or produce. And that's where mm -hmm. I think, gosh, grains really can be a really adaptive thing if you're dry farming, if you're farming under low water conditions. You know, if you look at arid and semi-arid regions around the world, um, you know, you'll often find grains. So um, that's, you know, something to think about, too, is not even just the distinctions between the grains, but also just, you know, might mm -hmm grains be a good thing, you know, I mean, we're definitely having these conversations in California, because our whole agricultural economy is really based around specialty crops, most of which take a lot of water, you know, and, and it's arid and getting more arid. <laughs> so there's a, there's a great grains group in California um, that's also, you know, talking about, gosh, you know, in some of these areas where we're, um, using a lot of energy to pump in irrigation, um, we 
probably might want to think about grain, <laughs> which our state has actually more of a history of growing grain than we're doing right now. But it all kind of comes back to this idea of, um, you know, regional grain sheds. Um, and instead of us importing all of our grain, um, there's probably some places where it's environmentally appropriate for us to be growing, you know, some of our own community grain. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, and Liz, did you see the question from, from Trudy Kretzinger about, uh, about production distribution systems? Yeah, that's a great, you know, super holistic question, Trudy, about, you know, what's missing in this grain chain um, as we're trying to re-regionalize, right? What would we need to have in place to actually kind of fully transition away from the mostly commodity grain economy that we have to this awesome regional grain economy that you're hearing Jessica talking about so that all of us, you know, we're really participating in that. Um, and I think, you know, I know we have Andy on this call um, who's leading this Colorado grain chain effort, who's really kind of looking at that 10,000 foot view. Um, and I wonder if you might want to step in on that, Andy, and talk a little bit about mm. what you see as some of these key missing pieces um, for this grain chain to really become the way, you know, Coloradans as a whole experience grain. Sure. I mean, you know, if you look at Colorado as a, as a <clears throat> grain growing state, it's a, it's, um, you know, most of the western part of the state is growing some form of grain, and a lot of which is prime wheat growing territory, mm -hmm. both dry land and irrigated. Um, mm -hmm. But it's mostly uh, conventional um, uh, growing practices and, and, and modern wheat varieties. A lot of it is going to, um, you know, the really big, um, there are folks who almost have um, uh, you know, land that they, somebody else comes and, and picks the seed variety, plants on their land, and they never even harvest it. They just see combines rolling out there one mm. day, taking their wheat away, and they get a check in the mail. Mm. And <clears throat> I, I've been here for 25 years and driven by these, as a baker, um, that whole time and driven through these wheat fields on my way to work and thought like, wow, what beautiful fields. I wonder where all that wheat goes. And I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what kind of wheat that is. And, um, and so, Somewhat recently, you know, outside of Chris Goser and, and, and um, some other folks who have been plugging away for a long time, um, sort of quietly and selflessly um, throughout the states in, in, in serving local economies like uh, tumbleweed, um, we're just now experiencing a rebirth of, of small organic um, uh, local family farms that are putting in five or 10 acres next to their vegetable crops that they're taking to farmer's markets and, and finding a lot of success in rotating that through as part of their um, overall kind of rotation um, program and, um, you know, a lot less labor intensive. Um, it reminds me of where uh, kind of ranchers are at right now in the U.S. trying to mm -hmm. just raise, you know, a few dozen head of um, uh, cattle, for example, where do you take them to slaughter? How do you process them? How do you distribute them? The system is not set up for community at this moment anymore. It's set up for commodity. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing missing that we're seeing is um, we, we've now got a, a, a host of mills in Boulder County. We have three uh, or kind of four in a way in the past couple of years. Um, and then there's some mills, you know, spotted throughout the state at bakeries, at hubs. Um, but there's a lack of cleaning facilities for grain. So, um, you know, I, I probably have a conversation every week or two with a farmer who says, you know, I really want to grow it or I did grow it. <laughs> Where do I take uh, less than a truckload to get cleaned? And it, that's really tricky. And the answer has been to this point, you know, go on to um, your local farm auction and buy a hundred year old uh, wooden cleaner for 2000 bucks and get a grease gun and, <laughs> uh, and a sanding block and make that thing work. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other opportunity for growing this re regional local grain economy is to have, um, is to adjust your expectations for um, what you're getting. If there's a little bit of um, you know, some whiteheads in the, in, in your bag of wheat, or maybe a little bit of volunteer buckwheat seed or a couple kernels of rye, because that was just in the field as a cover crop. Geez, that's kind of okay. 
right? And I think- So our, you're saying this as a baker, like if you yeah. get a bag of wheat, <laughs> or do you yeah. mean if, if Chris at the mill gets a bag of wheat like that? I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. And the reason is that, <laughs> that, that it takes really expensive, big equipment to, mm. um, you know, clean that, that wheat to that serous seed level. And mm. I don't mind a little bit of, you know, I don't want rocks, you know, um, and I don't, you know, but uh, I'll tell you, we get some wild stuff. Um, you know, there, you know, some of these uh, lady, ladybugs, um, there was a year we were getting, you know, I, I considered it sort of like pixie dust because ladybugs are so magical and beautiful and lucky. I'm like, well, you know, maybe not vegan, but there's quite a few ladybugs here or, you know, um, uh, but mostly it's just, it hasn't, uh, the, the kernel hasn't come free of the husk and, you know, those are called whiteheads and you've got a couple of them in the bag. Um, you know, the, the pure, the puritanical, um, you know, clean sort of neat, neat freak would, would refuse that, but it's almost like a conversation of, of ugly fruit, you know, um, you know, organic apple, may have a little bruise on it and big whoop. So, um, you know, that said, our, the growth in the past few years uh, of, of small farms, you know, you know, let's just say five acres, you know, folks sort of dip in their toe and has been immense. And the conversion of farmers that are multi-generational um, big wheat farmers, who, who are the folks that we really need on board? These are like the old wise, you know, men and women who, have seen cycles and droughts and blights, like they know what they're doing. They've got all equipment in the shed. They're ready to rock. Those individuals are more and more showing up and asking like, Hey, what's this heirloom wheat stuff? You know, I, my grandfather did it and, but geez, we sort of got, you know, we had, we had, um, we jumped on the chemical bandwagon because, you know, as Bob, Bob Quinn uh, has said many times that that was like better, um, you know, progress through, um, you know, chemical farming, that was just what you did. That was, if you're a smart farmer in the fifties and sixties, uh, that was progress, you know? And then suddenly people are like, wait, we're poisoning our food source. That ain't progress, not for yield. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I wonder, you know, Jessica, if you could talk a little bit about what you see as opportunities that could create kind of enabling conditions for more people to create bakeries like yours. And I wonder if maybe you could just talk a little bit about the Cottage Food Act, because that does seem like one important thing that happened recently, <laughs> um, without which it might be really challenging to do what you're doing. But I wonder if you could also talk about other things um, that either are in process or could be done um, so that there could be more tumbleweed breads in every community. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so first the, the Cottage Food Act of Colorado, um, the kind of basic rules about that are that you can produce certain foods, which most baked goods are, are okay, um, out of your home kitchen that is not licensed or inspected. As long as you take a food handler's course um, you label all your products appropriately with, um, you know, ingredients and a disclaimer saying it was, you know, produced in a home kitchen. And you also have to sell directly to the consumer. So I can't do any wholesale, for example. I can't have, you know, a store sell my bread for me. I have to sell it directly to the, to the customer at a farmer's market or, you know, right now we do online sales, but then deliver you know, in person. Um, and I believe that the, there's a limit to how much you can sell, but it's quite high. So it's $10,000 per year per product. So like my mountain mama loaf is one product separate from the turmeric onion loaf. So I can, um, you know, sell $10,000 worth of each individual product, which like really, when you think about that, like, like the sky's the limit, you know, I, I think I know that um, David Kaminer at Raleigh Street Bakery, um, he's still a cottage foods bakery, um, very successful, just just plugging away at his his home bakery, which is <laughs> just incredible. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if just a lot of people don't know about the Cottage Foods Act. I don't even remember where I heard about it in the first place. Um, this is pretty recent, right? I mean, this is just within the last 10 years. Yeah, 
Yeah, and they've revised it a couple of times. Um, but you can sell lots of things under the Cottage Foods Act. Um, but generally, you know, non potentially non hazardous things. So, you know, like I can't bake pumpkin pie, for example, or things that have um, cream in them that need to be kept refrigerated. Um, so that's kind of a bummer because I really love pumpkin pie <laughs> <laughs> or like bread pudding, you know, um, things like that. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an incredible, incredible, um, opportunity for me personally. And, um, because I was able to kind of do this in the Valley where there's really not other people kind of doing the same thing that I'm doing, um, you know, people recognize that. And so last year, actually around this time, we, found this uh, derelict little building here in Monta Vista that's actually just a few blocks from my house. Um, and so we, uh, with the help of many loans, um, <laughs> purchased a building that we're currently renovating um, to actually create a, you know, a community bakery. Um, you know, I love like, for example, what Moxie Bread is, is doing, you know, up, up there. And I, it's, it's really inspiring to see that community aspect and even though we have not quite the same sort of community down here, I'm hoping that we can kind of tap into a little bit of that, um, partially because the bakery uh, is on a whole lot. So we didn't just buy the building. So we have a lot of trees and we're gonna, um, you know, have a lot of garden space and a greenhouse um, and hopefully, you know, also our, our eventual goal is to kind of have half of Tumbleweed Bread actually be more of a nonprofit educational side for people. Um, of course, that's many years down the line, but um, yeah, so that's kind of what we've been doing. I forgot the second part of your question was just kind of yeah. enabling factors, you know, how do we help um, foster more Tumbleweed breads out there? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure how to kind of reach other people who, besides maybe like Instagram, you know, like social media avenues. Um, and that has been huge with this yeah. grain, diverse grains movement. Yeah. So I, you know, I see, yeah, I've seen a ton of like little, you know, kind of cottage bakeries pop up across the country this past year, but not so much in our general area. Mm. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of that, I think just has to do with the, well, like I met a lot of the people at, from the grain chain, you know, at the um, UCCS grain school. Um, mm. So that is a, a, an amazing way to meet people and kind of see what everybody's doing um, and that you don't have to necessarily go the traditional route of just like open a bakery, you know, cause that's like, that's an insane jump for, for a lot of people. Um, you know, most people are comfortable with doing one loaf in their Dutch oven, you know, and then kind of growing from there. Um, but, uh, yeah. And, you know, I think that generally having access to good flour can still be a challenge if you don't live in a city. Mm. Um, like if I wasn't, well, one, if Chris Goser wasn't such a welcoming person, mm. you know, um, I wouldn't feel as, as good about, you know, just texting him any old time I kind of need something and driving out there. Mm. Um, so that's a really unique thing I think that I have here in the valley um so yeah i think in rural communities you just wouldn't see as many kind of cottage foods things pop up or people might sell but not do it like really to the um requirements of cottage foods kind of more like under the table mm. sort of stuff which you know is is okay i i guess but um you know, it, it doesn't take much to, to kind of just do, do your due diligence and, you know, just do those few things that really, you know, set you up. 
so that you can, you know, be at the farmer's market legitimately, um, that sort of thing. But farmer's markets, you know, that's a great way to for people to find out what's going on. Like I, I always had this, this one lady come by every week and she would look at the breads and be like, oh, this is so great. And like, ask me all about how I get my oats to stick to the loaves, you know, and stuff. And then she'd be like, well, great. Thanks for the information. You know, like I'm a baker, all your stuff looks so good. And I think maybe she bought something from me once and, and loved it. But in general, you know, she was frugal and she baked herself, which is amazing. And I love also just being able to kind of give people knowledge about, you know, other things. And it's not just about purchasing something from me, you know, so that's also really fulfilling. I, mm. I would, I would add another really um, wonderful uh, tool we have at our disposal, which is um, a home mill, a uh, mock mill. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an investment like a Vitamix, right? And for anybody who's who's taken out a home loan to buy a Vitamix, is probably really happy they did. Um, a mock mill is about the size of a blender, and it costs anywhere from three to six hundred dollars. You can get a two hundred dollar attachment that attaches to your home um, mixer, your KitchenAid, and the opportunity that that opens up is you can buy grain. Grain lasts for a really long time, and it's you know, is unlocked the second you grind it. So, you know, you could be in a more remote, um, you know, part of the country or Colorado, and you could swing by your local farmer um, and pick up some super awesome Emmer or um, Rouge de Bordeaux, a 50 pound bag for probably less than 50 bucks. And, you know, we, we have one, one of our, um, one of our millers actually, Joan has her own, um, CSA bike delivery uh, program. So she works for me four days a week. And on Friday, she bakes bread that she mills at home. And then she has, you know, a handful of people that she delivers on her burly trailer in her neighborhood and gets that community. She, we, she has woven herself into the community. She has the joy of knowing the farmers like Chris Goser and, and you know, getting to uh, receive these grains, you know, with, with us, um, and know this, the, the stories of the lives of the farmer and not just some, it's not like Cisco or Shamrock Foods is just dropping a pallet and some driver leaves an invoice on the pallet, you know, you become part of the community through these interactions. And so it can be a really small, you don't even have to be a cottage level, you know, like Jessica was saying, you could just sort of do the church bake sale you know, or the, or the uh, brownie bake sale vibe and, and you're, and you're off to the races. Cool. That actually sounds like one um, great answer to this really generous question from um, Avi Rubin here, who's asking us, um, aside from supporting financially, how can I best support the cause? If I could afford five to six hours volunteering per week, what would be the best way for me to spend that? I don't know if you have ideas Jessica, about things, um, you know, if folks on this call are inspired and thinking about how do I help grow the local grain revolution? <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, I guess I would kind of look at what the bottlenecks people were talking about sort of in the chat of, you know, a lot of that is in the cleaning and, um, you know, the that kind of manual labor on the between the farm and the cleaning and the mill probably to me is kind of where I could see a lot of extra, you know, physical bodies being really, really useful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting. I'm just seeing Avi drop in the chat um, that he's in Boulder or she's in Boulder or they're in Boulder. Um, I, um, Something that's that's um, stood out to me about Boulder is is that Boulder has um, done this good food purchasing policy, and I'm curious if that's impacting any of the bread purchases um, in the school district. But that was one thing that was coming to mind for me is, um, you know, public procurement and why 
why aren't our school districts <laughs> and all of our um, you know institutions our healthcare institutions buying more local regional organic um, and this good food purchasing policy is one vehicle that communities around the country are using um, as a way to kind of um, you know set some guidelines for public procurement and school districts in particular but public purchasing in general. And I know Boulder is somewhere along that path, um, but I think it's the only community in Colorado, actually. It's interesting. There's a lot of farms, Avi, in Boulder, as you know. Uh, Masa Seed Foundation um, needs help year round. They're growing out hundreds of varieties of uh, locally, regionally adapted seeds for their seed bank. And their work starts, you know, their heavy lifting starts in winter actually when they're going through and cleaning seed slowly all year. So we send a lot of people out there. Um, you know, Black Cat Farm often takes woofs or helpers, Aspen Moon, uh, Speedwell Farm. Um, there's there's lots of opportunities, especially come, come harvest time. Um, you could get your six hours in real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're um, we're coming close to the end of the hour. I'm curious if um, folks have other questions for Jessica or me or for Andy Clark from Colorado Grain Chain, who's on here with us. Mm, that's a great point, Sarah, about um, you know, one thing that folks can do, including home bakers, I think. And as Andy pointed out, you know, as a home baker, you can have a pretty significant audience. You can be baking for a lot of folks at a church bake sale or any number of, you know, community institutions you might be involved in that, that bakers and millers have this platform to give shout outs to farmers since they have um, a direct retail stage or connection to eaters. Um, and I was, you know, that's why I was thinking about Jessica really as an ambassador in many ways. And I, I think you spoke so powerfully to the education piece of your work that ultimately you're selling a product, but you're also telling a story and providing a connection between an eater and a community of farmers. And I think, you know, one real theme <laughs> of this commodity agricultural economy is this disconnect um, between folks who eat and folks who farm and often you know how little connection we really have to where food comes from or a sense of agency of, of being able to choose um, the kind of agriculture and the kind of you know rural um, community that we'd like to see so I think you're absolutely right on there Sarah that um, as a baker um, as a miller uh, you have a chance to be a storyteller and make some of those connections. <laughs> this is a hilarious question from Zach, um, uh, that you love the lentil underground uh, and what is my favorite pulse legume? <laughs> I bet you can guess. <laughs> um, but I, I also love, in addition to lentils, um, all of the wonderful pulses and legumes that are such wonderful rotation crops with grain. <laughs> Oh yeah, and Sarah, um, I I love when people like tag me or or post things about tumbleweed bread. Um, I'm not super great at Facebook, <laughs> so I feel like sometimes things will be tagged on me, and then I'll I'll be like browsing my own page like <laughs> months later, and I'm like, somebody made an awesome sandwich, and like <sighs> I didn't get a notification. Um, way better at Instagram. I'm on top of Instagram, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I love, uh, being a part of the community online or, or in person. I'm very much looking forward to being back at the farmer's market this year. Um, Alamosa farmer's market and the Monta Vista farmer's market. Um, and then yes, hopefully, we have a lot of work to do yet still on getting an actual retail location open, um, partially because we need to build a bathroom. Um, but so hopefully um, the end of the year, uh, but yeah, we'll renovate it enough so that I can actually bake out of that space, hopefully relatively soon so that I can bake more for the farmer's markets. 
Oh, yeah, do you? <laughs> Fancy <laughs> composting toilet? <laughs> I wish we could use composting toilets. That would be so great. <laughs> That's another great issue for groups like soil to work on. Yeah. Um, all of those kind of legal dimensions of yes. economies that we want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Jessica, I have a quick question for you. Did you find a lot of difference in baking breads from your Portland experiences to when you came back to Monte Vista in the differences and just even humidity in the air uh, and how the breads reacted in the different grains? Yes and no. I think partially because, you know, I, I didn't have access to any of the same flowers you know, already that was such a change. So even though we're at almost about 8,000 feet here, um, you know, I didn't necessarily have trouble with altitude because basically everything was different anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely stuff dries out faster here. So, oh, yes. you know, definitely I cover my loaves more as they're proofing and, you know, I do recommend to my customers that they store their bread in a plastic or some other kind of bag, which is very different from other climates where they say, just leave it on your cutting board, you know, cut side down. And I'm like, that would become a brick in like a day here. So, you know, there's, there's certain differences. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's so different that it took a long time to just make a decent loaf when I actually got here, actually. So um, yeah, I made a, a fair amount of, of pretty weird looking things when I first got here. <laughs> but that's that's the beauty of baking is you just do it again. And oh, sure. It gets yes. better. That's right, that's right. Well, uh, are there any other questions from the group that's here before we start to uh, close up for the evening? There was plenty of, plenty of questions in the chat, but um, feel free to unmute yourself if there's anything else you want to ask either Jessica or Liz or Andy tonight. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I think it's given us a lot to, uh, to talk about and certainly make notes as to the different farmers markets. You said you'll be at the farmers market in Monte Vista, Jess, Jessica, and which other market this summer? And Alamosa. And Alamosa. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. Um, and so I also have Christo will have Woody Tosh as our um, speaker for May. Uh, I think it's the 27th, the fourth Thursday in May. Woody will be with us and you're welcome to, I put in the chat right up at the very top of the chat, the uh, website for Soil Sandra Christo as well as the email address. So feel free to contact me or sign up through the website if you want to be on the mailing list to know about the other events or have any other questions. And Liz, thank you so much for coming all the way from California <laughs> to be with <laughs> us this evening. <laughs> and Jess from Monte Vista to join us. And, and Andy, thank you too. I guess we're not gonna hear your banjo tonight, but that'll be for the next time around. <laughs> Well, um, it's but, funny I mentioned it, PJ, because I thought Liz was going to play a little song. Oh, <laughs> I'm wrong. Well, we still well, have a few minutes if you want to put in a little Yeah, bit. like a two-minute country tune would fit right in right now. Well, in all my research about Liz, you know, like, I started getting more and more nervous because I'm like, holy shit, she's a country oh. music star, too. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, what do we have to do? Is it go like this? Like, Liz, Liz, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody should be forced to, to do something musical. But. I've been coercing here for months and, uh, you know, we will okay. just, we'll keep, we'll keep pushing. Okay. That might, right, so. might to, uh, it might take the in-person convening. When, when Jessica's fed me enough chocolate chip cookies, who knows what might happen? Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much. I will look forward to seeing you again, maybe next month. Uh, when Woody's here and uh, please stay in touch. We appreciate you all very much. Liz and Jessica, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, PJ. Good night, Thank everyone. you. Thank you. <laughs>